So we're looking at thankful for the fruit of the Spirit, and this week we're going to look at goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control specifically, but the underlying theme of this week is to go from the root to the fruit. Okay, in week one, we discovered that you cannot be led by the Spirit and by the flesh at the same time. Anyone ever tried that? <laughs> I think we've tried that a few times. It doesn't work, does it? Because the flesh and the Spirit are at odds with each other. They're contrary to one another. It'll pull you apart. It'll tear you apart. If you try to uh, justify and condone and dwell in sin and try to live by the power of the Spirit at the same time, it'll make you crazy. It really will. It'll pull you apart because they're at odds with each other. The spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another. And we're going to read the passage in a minute, but it says that by the power of the spirit that we crucify the misdeeds of the flesh. So God gives us the power to do that by his grace. Week two, we discovered that it's his fruit given to us. We can't produce it on our own. When we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, it's not just you know, a congenial spirit or just uh, a good personality that some people are gifted with. It's not just natural leadership or natural traits that some people seem to be born with. We're talking about something that is divine. Something that comes from the very presence of God Himself. God's own qualities, God's own fruit put within our lives. It's fruit that is given and must be freely received. It's not fruit that can be produced naturally within ourselves. Last week we saw that abiding is the key to abounding. Abiding is the key to abounding. So there is a presence of God if we're saved. God lives in us. He doesn't go anywhere. If I am depressed, is God still in me if I'm a believer? Absolutely. If I'm sick, is God still in me if I'm a believer? Absolutely. If I'm struggling, is God still in me if I'm a believer? Absolutely. If I'm on the mountaintop and feeling excited, is God still in me? Absolutely. He doesn't go anywhere, does He? God is in us. There's an abiding presence of the Spirit. And abiding is the key to abounding. But having said that, there's also a manifest presence of the Spirit within our lives. God's always in us. If we, Jesus is our Savior, He's in us. He's not going anywhere. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But sometimes we need to get away with God so that we can get into the manifest presence of God. Amen? And it's like being married. I mean, my wife and I can be completely committed. You know, we can set by each other day after day. We can love each other. And my wife's my wife and I'm her husband. But there are times when we need to get away and spend time together to bring life into that relationship. I'm telling you from experience, and I know you have the same experience, when you're struggling with patience, when you're struggling with goodness and kindness and self-control, it, it doesn't mean God's gone anywhere, but it means that you better get away. Spend some time with Jesus so you can get the manifest presence of God. I'll tell you what, sometimes I am the most patient guy when I have no need, when I have no, not need, when I have no uh, reason. When all the circumstances say I shouldn't be patient, if I'm spending time with Jesus, I'm just in perfect peace and patience. And other times, life may look great and I may be impatient because I just need to spend time with Jesus. Jesus is our source. Amen? We've got to spend time with God. So don't self-justify. This was last week. We spent some time on this. We got to, abiding is the key to abounding. We've got to abide in the presence of God if we want the manifest fruit of the Spirit within our lives. This week, we're going to look at how it goes from the root of the plant to the fruit. The root to the fruit. As we consider these last four fruit of the Spirit. Let's go ahead and read Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. Uh, oftentimes, the Word just says so much on its own. You could take just this passage and preach a lifetime and still find more. So we want to each week just read the Word and let the Word itself do its work before we do any explanation of it. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. For the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, 
idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. See that verse right there, verse 25. That's saying just what I was saying when I opened. How it's not just about having an abiding presence of God, but we want a manifest presence of God in our lives. So if we're in the Spirit, let's walk in step with the Spirit. And walking in step with the Spirit is what will bring the manifest presence of God. It's just like uh, trying to, to hitch up a wagon. If you don't, uh, you know those old wagons where you had to put the pin through? If you don't line it up, you can't get the pin through. But if it's lined up, the pin will slip right in. And uh, that's, that's what it's like. If, we're, if we want to manifest the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we have to remember, these are not natural fruit. I will not manifest them on my own. So what i got to do is i got to line up with God. i got to walk in step with the Spirit. And the more I line up with God and walk in step with the Spirit, the more the fruit of the Spirit will manifest in my life. We don't need a new revelation. Sometimes we need the old revelation just lived out. I think it's great to get new words and to get fresh revelation from God and rhema word. But rhema word don't do nothing if you don't act out on logos word. we got to live and walk in step by the power of the Spirit if we expect to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. That's getting under the spout where the glory comes out. Go over to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 talks about that importance, again, of being rooted, of being grounded in Christ. That's what brings the manifest presence of the fruit of the Spirit. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So if we're rooted in Christ, we're going to be like that tree that is beside the stream of God's presence, the river of God's, God's presence. One thing that we may overlook in that at times is that it says that the tree will bear its fruit in its season. Sometimes, like this time of the year, you might look at a tree and it might look dead. But it doesn't mean that it's dead. It's just in a winter season. So we got to be careful not to judge by the surface of things, there may be life enough inside. I'll tell you what, the best producing apple tree may look dead right now to the untrained eye. If you just looked at a picture of it, and well, that, that tree's dead, but that tree just may be full of life. It may be full of uh, just bountifulness, but it's just in a dormant season. But I'll tell you what, you watch that tree, that tree's coming back. And that tree's going to have leaves and blooms and fruit abounding on that thing. I mean, th this is how it works when we're rooted by the presence of the Lord. The life is within us. By being rooted in Jesus, by being founded on the rock, the deeper the roots go in Jesus, the deeper we go in the abiding presence of God, the more we're going to manifest fruit. So don't just spend time on appearance. Don't just spend time on looking right, saying the right things. Some people just know how to say the right things. They're just maybe a little bit silver-tongued. And they don't have any root within themselves. But they just seem to have that ability to just keep deceiving people. And people, some people that lack discernment just keep following. And you're like, how in the world do you not see this? 
we have some certain individuals in the leadership of our country right now. God save them, we pray, for a genuine salvation. One of our leaders who thinks he's a monarch right now can use the Bible, but if you watch his speech, he was quoting the Bible to use his most recent executive action. But then if you go back to when he was talking to all of his buddies, he was saying, well, if we followed the Bible, then, uh, then what, how would our military respond to that? If we followed the Bible, then uh, how would, uh, you, you know, if we did what Jesus, if Jesus did that, that just wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work with our government. You see, how is it that somebody can so blatantly put down the Bible, so blatantly disregard the Word of God, and that's what he does over here, but when he needs it, he can conveniently quote the Word of God, and there's a mass of believers that are so deceived that they'll just follow right behind that. You see, I'm telling you, being rooted is the key to abounding. It's not about what's on the surface. It's not about being able to say the right thing. And I'll tell you when the storm comes, when the trial comes, you'll know who just looks good and you'll know who's rooted deep. Because that tree, that tree may produce a bountiful life. If it's rooted in Jesus, it may look dead on the surface. But I'm telling you, there's a day of great exchange that's coming. There's a day of manifestation that's coming because God knows the way of the righteous. God who watches over us does not sleep. He does not slumber. God remembers His children and God knows that are rooted in Him. Sometimes the enemy may just even come with so many trials that he cuts that tree off like a stump. And you say, there's no hope for that. Blah, you know, scoff. There's no hope. Look at that. That's just the stump. But Job said, though the stump may wax old in the ground and the root may grow old, it'll bud again and it'll, it'll bloom again. You see, when you're rooted in Jesus, when you're rooted in Jesus, ab abiding in Jesus, being rooted in Jesus will bring a fruitfulness in your life. Don't spend so much time on image on doing everything right. Spend time on being rooted in Jesus. It's more about being rooted than looking right. It's more about where the root is at than what the appearance looks like. I don't know how many times I can say this, but it's more about being rooted in Jesus than looking right. God knows those that are His, and God is going to honor those that are His, and God is going to defend those that are His. I'll tell you what, did they all come after Job when Job went through the struggle? When the enemy attacked him. But Job's wife didn't recognize it to our knowledge as an attack of the devil. Job's friends didn't recognize it to our knowledge as an attack of the devil. They recognized it as a problem with Job. But the enemy was testing that man. He was cutting him off. And we know that God, even there, He set a limit. But God, where God got the glory wasn't from the struggle of Job. Where God got the glory was from the deliverance of Job. And Job part two is double for the trouble. So you can't always judge by the surface of things. You've got to judge by the root of things. And uh, God knows those that are His. You, you know, you've got to just expect there's going to be persecution in this life. People aren't going to like you if you love Jesus. Some people, not everybody. Some aren't going to like you. But you got to be rooted. I mean, remember the story of the house when it was built upon the rock when the storm comes? That, rock, that uh, house stands, doesn't it? Because it's built upon the rock. A tree will bear its fruit in the season. Sometimes you will go through a dormant season. But don't get stuck there. And don't get discouraged there and realize that there is coming a season of manifestation. If you're rooted in Jesus, then you're going to abound in much fruit. Fruit that is uh, sticking fruit, the word says, fruit that will remain. Amen? Well, let's look at, we're looking at goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control this week specifically. The word goodness, if we go back to Galatians chapter 5, is uh, goodness in the Holy Spirit. The word goodness is generosity. It's being open-hearted, not closed-minded or closed-hearted towards others. Again, 
this is not just the natural trait of goodness. We all know some good people. Being good doesn't save anybody. Being saved, having faith in Jesus is what saves you. It's not just talking about a natural trait of goodness. This is talking about a divine attribute of God that as we abide in the presence of the Savior, as we're rooted in Jesus, then the Holy Spirit will bring a manifestation of the goodness of God within our lives. Okay, goodness, according to Rose Publishing, goodness is the selfless desire to be open-hearted and generous to others above what they deserve. Okay, Jesus exemplifies this. Titus, that we'll look at a couple, but Titus 3, 4 through 7 says, When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Notice that phrase, justified by His grace. Because God is good. The fact that I am good in Jesus has very little or nothing to do with me. And it has everything to do with Him because He is good. He justified us by His grace. Not talking about self-justifying. If you, may, if you do something that you think is right, it's real easy to justify it, isn't it? Isn't it easy? I mean, you wouldn't have done it if you didn't think it was right. You can justify yourself, and you can give every reason why. Here's the list. But this is not what it's talking about. It's not talking about how we can defend ourselves or justify ourselves, but because God is good, Because God is just, God Himself is able to justify us. It doesn't matter what I say about myself. It matters what God says about me. Now, illustrate this a little bit. If I get a job, a holiday job at Best Buy, I'm not, I'm just illustrating. If I I go to Best Buy and I get a holiday job for the seasons, and I get in there and I find out, man, I'm pretty good at Best Buy. I mean, I... I'm pretty good at this job. (laughs) Preston will laugh, won't you? Because I'm not, I'm, I know I'm younger than you, but I'm not as technical as I should be at my age on computers and stuff. I know enough to get by, but I certainly wouldn't make it at Best Buy. Okay, so anyway, I get a Best Buy job, and I find out I'm pretty efficient at this job. I'm pretty good at this job. Maybe I am really good at that job. Maybe I am. Maybe I just got the solutions, and I can take people right to the product, and I know that I'm good at it. And I know that I'm always at work on time, and I always stay late, and I always get the customer where they need to be, and man, the sales go through the roof. I mean, I am good at that job, and I know it. But no matter how good I am at that job, does it matter how good I can say that I am at that job if the boss doesn't notice? It doesn't. It doesn't matter how good I am. I could be the best guy at that job that has ever walked through the doors of Best Buy, but if the boss comes in and says, huh, and keeps on walking, then it doesn't matter how good I was. It's what the boss says that matters. Now, I could be... The worst guy that ever got a job at Best Buy. You know, I don't know. Is this the power button? Does this cable connect here? Oh, you really shouldn't buy that. That's a waste of money. I could be the worst guy ever, but if the boss walks in and says, I think you got potential. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote you. We're going to send you to training because I think you can be something one day. Does it matter what I said about myself or does it matter what the boss said? Uh, This is not hard to understand. It is not self-justification that saves anyone. we got to quit. See, so often when we're lacking in goodness or any of these other fruit, we'll try so hard to justify ourselves. Well, you know, I feel this way because I've tried a hundred times with that person, and that person just keeps... See, it's not... That's not what this is talking about. Because in human endeavors, there's a limit. But if God justifies, if God says there's hope for that person, if God says there's deliverance for that person, it matters what God says, not what I say. What this goodness is, is it's God's gift to us, and it's a manifestation of God's own goodness through us. 
We don't self-justify. We're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we have been justified by His grace that we might become heirs. See, what is heirs? We just read through this stuff and we don't think about it. What does it mean that we might become heirs? I mean, isn't that like a partnership? Isn't that like we're receiving a kingdom? Isn't that like... Uh, we're going to be one of the bosses someday. Now, I know God's the boss, and He's not going to lower Himself, and we're never going to be as big as Jesus. Get all that religion out of your head. I, I understand all that already. I get it. But if God's the boss, and if God says, look, if you'll just be rooted in me, if you'll just abide with me, if you'll just hang out with me, and if you'll just kind of go through the training, I'll tell you what, you're going to be an heir one day. You're going to be the boss. You're going to be, you're going to be with me. You see, it's not what I say about myself. It's what He says about me that matters. And this goodness in the Holy Spirit is a gift from God that will manifest itself in our lives as we abide in His presence. It, that, that's how it manifests. We abide with Him. Well, uh, the next one is faith. Okay, and these are all gifts in the Holy Spirit. Faith. The word means dependable, loyal, or full of trust. Uh, it, we usually interpret it faithfulness because of the context that it's in, but it's the word faith. It's the same word, faith and faithfulness. But what faith is, is it's just a quality of reliability, a quality of trust. And again, understanding that this is His fruit that will manifest itself in us as we're rooted in Him makes a big difference. Okay, Barclay calls it the virtue of reliability. This faithfulness, or this faith, is the virtue of reliable. Why am I reliable? I'm reliable because God made me reliable. Okay, I didn't just one day get all my ducks in the row and get all the sin out and get everything in order in my life, and so now God can use me. It doesn't work that way. I've been hanging out with the Savior, and I've picked up His traits. I've been rooted and grounded in Him, so I've started to manifest His fruit. This is a fruit of reliability. Because God is reliable, I can be reliable in Him. But I can be faithful in Him. It's not just believing that God can do it, but it's standing in God's power to do it. Okay, when we, let me, I'm going to say that again, because uh, it's important even though i know that this is more teaching this morning but this is important that you get this okay faithfulness when we talk about the fruit of the spirit is not understanding that god can do something that's not what this is talking about it's standing in god's power to do it if i said okay uh we're going hunting leon i believe that you can go kill a deer i believe that you could just knock that deer down easy. You're a good shot. You know, you're good with the rifle, and uh, you'll just nail that thing. You go out, and you're going you're gonna to kill that. I have complete faith that Leon is such a good shot that he can go out, and he can drop that deer, and he can kill that deer. I have faith in Leon. But if that attribute is going to be in my life, then what that's going to be is Leon saying, okay, I know I can do it, but we're not talking about what I can do here. We're talking about what you can do with me. So now you're going hunting with me and you're going to kill the deer, but I'm going to be standing there by you. This is what the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness is or faith. It's not just the knowledge that God can do something. Faithfulness or the reliability of God manifesting in us is what God will do through us as we abide in him. And it's, it's significant. Uh, Mark uh, 11:22 and 24, talk, Jesus talked about moving a mountain. And I want to read that. Jesus said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say to you, that whoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he has said will come to pass, he shall have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you will have them, and you will have them. Jesus told us, and we saw this last week, some of this just overlaps, how if we abide in Him, we'll bear much fruit, but apart from Him, we can do nothing. Remember that scripture? 
this is not a big deal that God has faith or that God is faithful. Okay, that's like, duh. Okay, God is faithful. Duh. God is faithful. God is faith. Duh. What it's saying is that you're to have this faith. You're to have this faithfulness working within your life. When Jesus said that you could say to the mountain, and you could speak in faith to that mountain in his name, and it could be removed. Why didn't he just do it? I mean, I guarantee if Jesus said it, it would have happened. So why did he tell the disciples, you speak to the mountain? Jesus never said, I'll, I'll move your mountain for you. He said, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. But he didn't say he's going to move the mountain. Jesus didn't say that he was going to save everybody. He said he's not willing that anyone should perish. But he told us to go. He told us to move the mountain. You see, this is the fruit of the spirit of faith or faithfulness. If I'm rooted in Christ, if I'm hanging out, keeping in step with the spirit, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in his name. I'm going to do it in his power. I'm going to do it by the delegation of his authority, but I'm going to do it. It may make you uncomfortable at times, but faith is an action word. Faith is a word that requires movement and action on our part. It's not good enough to know that God can do something. Big deal. Yeah, can God save everybody? He could, but He's not going to. Could God heal everybody? Sure, but He's not going to. Could, could uh, God do anything? Is He all-powerful? Absolutely. But He's not going to yield His strength that way because He said that you'll speak to the mountain in My name. You'll go to the nations in My name. He's delegated that task to us. And this trait of faithfulness or this fruit of faithfulness is God's faith manifesting within our life. Arguably, a lot of people that are scholars in the Word would tell you in the Greek language, it doesn't say have faith in God, but it says have the faith of God. It's a little bit different to have faith in somebody and to have the faith of somebody. If I said, Viola is such a prayer warrior, I got faith that if Viola prays, God will answer because Viola is a prayer warrior. I got faith in Viola. Is that different than having the faith of Viola? Having the faith of Viola means, oh, thank you, Viola, for your prayer support, but along with your prayer support, I'm going to pray and I believe that God is going to answer me when I pray because when I pray, God is listening and God is going to hear. This is, see, this is the fruit of faith within our life. It's not just, oh, I know you can do that, God. Oh, no problem. You can fix anybody, heal anybody, save anything. You can move any mountain. Well, duh, he's God. But the fruit of faith or faithfulness within our lives is when we begin to bear the same like and precious fruit as Jesus that's how it ought to be. We, if we're abiding in the Lord, are going to manifest the fruit of His goodness. And they'll say, oh, Pastor Dave, you're such a good person. Well, thank you. You know, thank you. I appreciate that. But really what you're saying is that the Holy Spirit of God is manifesting Himself in me. Pastor Dave, you're such, whoa, you're full of faith. I mean, you know that you're going to get a better vehicle than you had. You know that, that God is going to take care of that house in Indiana, Indiana. You're such a man of faith. Well, what you're really saying, what you're really saying is that the faith of God is manifesting itself in you. It's not natural to me because let me tell you, I say, oh my goodness. I don't know where the next house payment's going to come from. I don't know what I'm going to drive. I don't know what a... But see, that's natural. And, and in the natural, oh, I can work here and I can do this and I can do this. Well, just pooey on all that. Because I'll tell you what, I'll make a declaration of faith. I'm not standing in my own name here. I'm standing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord's not going to get glory from my wrecked van. He's going to get glory from my new vehicle. He's not going to get glory from a house payment in Indiana. He's going to get glory from that house being gone in the name of Jesus. Well, you're speaking awful bold there. What if something goes south? Well, that's God's problem. I'm just speaking in the faith of God. You see, it's not... It's not my faith, it's His faith given to me. But as I'm rooted in Him, as I'm grounded in Him, it'll manifest itself in my life. Oh, 
Well, pastor, we know God can sell your house. Well, so do I. We know God can replace your car. Well, so do I. But as I stand in the faith of God, that very same faith of God will manifest itself in my life. It's God's fruit given to us. The main point is that if we remain rooted in His faithfulness, the fruit of faith will manifest itself in in our lives. Stay rooted in faith. Don't just know that God can do it. Know that God will do it in you. Hallelujah. Well, the next quality is gentleness in the Holy Spirit. The Greek word means humility, calmness, non-threateningness, being humble, Calm, non-threatening, gentleness. Gentleness is a humble, non-threatening demeanor that derives from a position of strength and authority. It's useful in calming another's anger, and gentleness is not a quality that is weak or passive. So this gentleness is not just weakness or meekness. The gentleness of God manifested in our life is from a power of strength. Okay, was, was Jesus gentle? Yes, right? Jesus was very gentle. But could he have called two legions of angels? Did he say two or ten? I don't remember. He might have said ten. Uh, he was humble and he was gentle from a position of strength. He wasn't, whoa, they're going to kill me. They're going to destroy me. Uh, I, Jesus had no choice, but he had to hang upon the cross. He had those Jews killed him. He had no choice. Well, I'm speaking foolishly, of course, because that's not what happened at all. Nobody took his life from him. He freely laid it down. He was in a position of strength and authority, but instead of using that power and authority to destroy us, he did what he came to do. He came to save. He was on point. And He laid down His life for us. See, that's gentleness. We can't produce that within ourselves. We need the fruit of God to manifest gentleness within us. But I'll tell you what, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can prefer other people. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can lift up other people even if they put us down. That's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, Pastor Dave, you're just the most gentle guy I know. Not really. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can manifest His gentleness within my life. It's His fruit. I didn't read these scriptures, but we're told of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Woo! Hallelujah. That's good, Lord. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. See, grace isn't a license to sin. Grace is a license to live holy. Grace is a license to not be afraid of failure. And uh, Jesus said, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. That means we're supposed to learn something. We're not supposed to stay down, down there. We're supposed to rise up with the Lord. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, In your hearts revere Christ as the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. Now this is, I included this verse because of the next statement here. Look what it says at the end. But do this with gentleness and respect. Okay. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. (laughs) Oh, Pastor Dave, why are you so hopeful that God is going to take care of your finances and your house issue and your car issue? Why are you so hopeful? Because I got faith, you turkey! And if you would just straighten up and, and just get right and just fix your life, you would have it too. Duh! Well, see, that wasn't done very gently, was it? The word says, be able to do this gently. Have hope. Hey, you're not going to take my hope. Oh, Pastor Dave, we're so sorry for your situation. Well, okay. Oh, I don't think you can make it. I think you're going to go under. I think you're going to blah, blah, blah. You're not going to take my hope away. 
You can't have it. The world didn't give it to me. The world can't take it away. You didn't give it to me. You can't take it away. But I'll tell you what, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you feel that way, I'll do my very best to give you a gentle answer. I'll do my very best. I can't do it on my own. Uh, sometimes patience wears thin. But if I get in the presence of Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to begin manifesting His qualities within my life, I can say, sister, brother, don't worry about it. God's got it under control. Thank you for your concern. Thank you. I appreciate your concern. We'll just see what the Lord's going to do. And a gentle answer can turn away wrath. You see, that's God's gentleness in my life. That's not natural to me. I am not naturally a gentle person. It's a work of the Holy Spirit within my life that makes that possible. Well, the last one is self-control, which really goes very uh, closely related to gentleness, believe it or not. And it's self-control in the Holy Spirit. That, that's an important distinction. It's not just self-control. It's self-control in the Holy Spirit. Because there are many people that have, again, been born with a kind of self-control. I mean, they, they train, they run marathons, they, you know, uh, there was this lady that was stranded on an island. This is a true story. I think it was in the Pacific Ocean. And a kid was on Google Earth or Google Maps or something one day. And, you know, I don't know how frequently they take pictures on that stuff, but he saw an SOS on the island. And so he, you know, called it in and they checked it out, and it was really legitimate. There was legitimately a lady stranded on that island. She had been stranded there for almost two years. And somehow she survived because she had a daily regiment. She was self-disciplined. She had a disciplined daily regiment that when she would get discouraged, it would keep her hope up, and uh, she stayed alive. And that's not natural to most of us. Let's just be honest. That's, not a, uh, that's a quality that she got, and some people have it. Some people, you know, they decide, well, I'm going to run a marathon. So they set their mind to it, and they end up running a marathon. But this is not talking just about that kind of self-control. This is talking about self-control in the Holy Spirit. Because I'll tell you what, I don't care how self-controlled you are, when it comes to sin, you're powerless. This is self-control in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Joseph Prince shared a story of a man that goes to his church that is the highest... He's a pastor in Singapore, for those that that don't know. An Asian pastor. And he shared the story of a man in his church that is whatever the highest level of martial arts mastery can be. I I mean, basically from birth to old age or however old he is, that's all he's done. That's been his whole life is martial arts. And he's like the top, as high as you can go. They don't get any higher skill-wise. Than, and that guy, he, this is what he told Joseph Prince. He said, I'm, I'm so disciplined that I could go, you know, weeks without food, days without water. I could set, you know, he can go into deep concentration and he could, he could focus on one thing for days. But he said, in all of my discipline, I could never defeat the sin of pornography until I understood the message of the grace of God. You see, I don't care. There's a guy that is the most disciplined guy, perhaps, on earth. One of them, naturally disciplined. But he couldn't defeat sin with all of his discipline. Neither can you or I. This is talking about self-control in the Holy Spirit. When we abide with Jesus, when we're rooted in God, there's a self-control that comes into our life that we can possess our vessel. Man, you know, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. But I don't have to be kicked to and fro by sin. I've been delivered by the blood of Jesus. Oh, sure, sometimes I'll fall off the truck and I'll make mistakes and errors and miss the way and I'll sin at times. But it's not because... uh, anything was lacking in God, it's because I wasn't abiding in the presence of God. See, when you start seeing those things creep in, when you start seeing sin creep in, it's time to go spend some time with Jesus. Right? It's time. When you see yourself being impatient with your spouse, with your kids, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's just time to go spend some time with Jesus. He's in you, but yet as we abide in Him, as we become rooted in Him and spend time in Him, then His fruit will manifest in us. Was Jesus patient with you? Was Jesus good to you? 
Does Jesus have self-control? Well, we know the answer to that. Robertson says that this is the strength of holding oneself in. Thayer says it's the virtue of one who masters the desires and the passions and of sensual appetites. McKnight says, where this virtue subsists, temptation can have little influence. See, this is why when the Word talks about Jesus, it says that He was tempted in every way like we are, and yet He didn't sin. He was tempted, but He wasn't tempted at the same time, if that makes any sense. Okay? I, by the grace of God, am not tempted by alcohol. I could... I've never been an alcoholic. I've had a few drinks in my life, but I've never been drunk. That's my testimony. I've just just hasn't been an issue in my life. I absolutely could go set in a bar with no fear of getting drunk. Would there be temptation around? Sure, there'd be liquor all around me, but would it really be tempting me? No. It's never been an issue in my life. And it, unless that door was open, it's really not an issue in your life. Jesus was tempted in every way. Every temptation that assails man assailed Jesus, but that door was never opened in his life. He never sinned. There was never a foothold. There was never an open door. He was able to possess his vessel. Even though the temptation came his way, in the case of Jesus, he did not sin because of this attribute of self-control. It came from abiding with Heavenly Father. Jesus and the Heavenly Father were one. Because God has perfect self-control, Jesus had perfect self-control. It's great to say Jesus was a... What a wonderful person Jesus was. He walked sinlessly. He didn't sin. What a wonderful person. But again, what this is telling us is that this same attribute of self-control can be restored within our life if we're rooted in Jesus. We don't have to get tore up, all right? Uh, I mean, chocolate's good, but if you've got a chocolate addiction, chocolate don't have to tear up your life. Alcohol don't have to tear up your life. Drugs don't have to tear up your life. There's deliverance in Jesus, and as you abide in Him, there's a gift of self-control that we can receive as we abide in Jesus. I- I'm so fed up with people thinking that you get saved, but then you've got to be beat up the rest of your life. No. That happens because we're not keeping in step with the Spirit. We're not abiding in the Spirit. We're not abiding in the vine. And apart from Him, we can do nothing. But if we're with Jesus, there is great self-control. There is great ability just to say no to things and to possess our vessel. It says in Luke, uh, as we close, Luke 22, 42, Jesus said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will be done. How many of you know that took great self-control? To know, <laughs> to know, no matter what people think about you, it's all mine. I could just end this thing right now. And yet, with great self-control, Jesus said, Father, it's not what I want, it's what you want. Your will be done. We can have the manifestation of self-control in our life as we abide in Jesus. The conclusion of the whole thing, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit are manifestations of being in a rooted, abiding relationship with Jesus. Our roots have to sink below the surface of our lives. Our roots have to go deep. The deeper our roots go, the more bountiful and the more remaining our fruit will be.